Oh, thank you, Brian. You know, Brian shared with me Zach's advent calendar, and I just want to warn you, if you're thinking of taking this on, that there are some really abstract puzzles there. I mean, it is. this is not for the weak of heart. This is... This is a site for nerds. Let's just be real. I mean, it's only you guys that are really going to get into this. So um, I have not gotten past today's puzzle yet. And uh, so good luck for those of you who decide to take it on. Thank you, Zach. And uh, yeah, don't call me if you get stuck. Um, so you know, we seem to have picked up a theme verse for what we've been studying these past few weeks. And it's Romans 12, 5, and it says this, it says, Christ makes us one body and individuals who are connected to each other. And each and every one of us are created as individuals. He was knitting us together in the womb, it says in Psalm 139, and it says, with our own special skills and backgrounds to accomplish the things that he planned for us to do in Ephesians 2, 10. But all of that is also connected into one body. And one beautiful meld of all those different talents and personalities where we can collectively leverage our strengths, compensate for each other's weaknesses, and accomplish some really big things. Now, we don't always get it right. I know in my own life it has taken me a very long time to realize the power of this truth. I mentioned last week that I've been taking a grace bath over my pride while driving. Well, the truth is, that's just one of the areas I take a grace bath in. I fall short of what the Bible says all the time. It's why I'm thankful that God's grace is there to encourage me to get back up and to keep trying. Don't ever fall for the lie that God is beating you into submission through circumstances in your life. God only invites you to walk with him, to ask if he can walk with you. He picks you up when you fall. He doesn't kick you when you're down. We are all on a journey, both as individuals and together. And most of us understand and accept the individual journey. Where we struggle, I feel, is when we need to accept that we're on a journey together. How we're created for community, how we rise up through relationships, how we've been formed to be a family. The devil is just simply going to work against anything that God loves. So if God loves us being in relationships, you can be sure the devil is going to work against that. So I want to finish up this week looking at a couple more reasons why our relationships fail and the things that we can do to protect those relationships, make them stronger, or even repair them. You know, no relationship is beyond repair as long as at least one person is willing to do what it takes to work on that relationship. I mean, it's easy to be selfish. We're born selfish. Nobody needs to be taught how to be selfish. But two selfish people will never fix a relationship. Two selfless people are guaranteed to fix a relationship. And as long as one person in the relationship can be selfless, I believe that given enough time, that relationship can be repaired. Pride is kind of another one we don't really need to be taught because it's closely related to being selfish. Selfish. In some ways, pride is worse than selfishness because pride, in addition to being all about me, is about the other person being less. Pride says, me, 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 and oh, by the way, you're kind of a loser. I mean, pride is rough, and two proud people will never fix a relationship, ever because it takes humility. Two people humbling themselves to each other would be the most beautiful act, and that is a relationship that is guaranteed to not only be repaired, but strengthened. And one humble person can make a difference, because I think it's very hard and it's a very unusual person that doesn't give in when somebody else truly humbles themselves in front of them. Now. I don't know how you guys have been measuring up these past couple of weeks to these, but I will tell you that I have been learning about myself a bit, and I might have a pride problem. And if you don't know why I said it that way, you need to watch last week's message. But I am so thankful to have been gently reminded about what Jesus' reflection should look like in my life. Selflessness and humility are definitely areas that I could use some work in. And I'm thankful that God's shower of grace never runs out 
and that it never scalds and it never burns. That grace shower is refreshing and healing, and it makes me want to press on again with a renewed hope. So I've got two more to wrap this up with you today. And before we get into it, let's just pray quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord God. I thank you for this time to examine ourselves, Lord. I thank you that your grace is so gentle, Lord God, that your correction is kind and loving, Lord. So Father, as we press into more areas where our relationships can be strengthened, Lord God, I pray you continue to reveal in us those areas where we fall short. And uh, Father, I thank you that you stand there with your hand out. And uh, I just thank you for your grace in every one of these areas, Lord. So, Father, I pray that your word will come alive to us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would be invited to do his work. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I alluded to this next relationship zapper last week when I told you that humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Thinking less of yourself is called insecurity. And a struggle of insecurity is another thing that can destroy relationships. Let's get right to a verse. Bible says in Proverbs 29, it says, The fear of human opinion disables. Trusting in God protects you from that. When I get insecure so that all I think about is your opinion and what you think of me, the Bible says that that becomes disabling in my life. And the disabling factor there is fear. It's fear of human opinion. And when we're so afraid of what others think of us, we inadvertently can wind up trying to control each other, and that destroys relationships. For example, think of the expression, I hate you. I hate you. For most of that, that is one of the most hurtful things you can hear from another human being. That statement, though, is actually an attempt at that person getting control of you. Like, you're not doing what I need you to or want you to do, so I'm going to say this statement to you, and because that's such a harsh and hurtful statement, that might get you to change more into what I need or want you to be. Now, what's beneath that control? Well, it's fear. Because Webster defines insecurity as deficient in assurance, beset by fear and anxiety. Fear of what others think causes us to try to control people. And anxiety about what others think causes us to resist control from others. And that destroys relationships. You know, there's just this strange dichotomy that we have as human beings when it comes to closeness. We have this innate longing and desire, and we were created to be close, but we also fear being close. We want it, but we don't want it. We long to have intimacy with others, but we're also scared to death of that intimacy. Insecurity, that fear and anxiety of not being sure about yourself, prevents intimacy. Because you just can't get close to someone if there's fear in the relationship. I mean, honestly, this is one of the reasons I don't support people living together that aren't married. Because no matter what, there's always a fear that the other person can go at any time because there's no strings. They could, they can just leave. That's the whole reason you live together first is because we just want to see if this works out. Well, without that fear, without with that fear of the other person going all the time, there's always something that kind of gets held back. And you don't get that true intimacy if you're always a little afraid or unsure of the other person. But when you're fully committed and there's an assurance, like through marriage, then the fear goes away. And when the fear goes away, the walls come down and each person really reveals who they are. And that's when real intimacy begins. There's two fears that cause insecurity when it comes to relationships. And the first one is exposure. We fear that somebody's going to find out what we're really like, what's going on in our lives. So we hide ourselves because we don't want people to know what we're really like. You know, insecurity was one of the first things that got behind, got between the relationship between God and Adam and Eve. As soon as they ate the forbidden fruit, 
they experienced fear and insecurity. Genesis 3, it says, And as they ate it, suddenly they became aware of their nakedness and were embarrassed. So they strung fig leaves together to cover themselves, and they hid themselves among the trees. All of a sudden, they were concerned what God was going to think about them. And so the first thing they did was cover up in fear and hide. And Adam told God, he said, I was naked, and when I heard you walking through the garden, I was frightened, and I hid. And we do the same thing in our relationships when we're insecure about ourselves. When we're afraid, we hide ourselves. We cover up. We wear masks. We pretend to be people that we're not. There's this emotional nakedness that we're afraid of. What if someone understands and finds out my fears, my faults, my dark side, or finds out these parts that I don't want anybody to know? Fear of what other people think and are going to think of you is what causes us to hold back truths and build up walls. And the result is nobody ever gets to know you. And if we don't get to know each other, there's a whole lot of things that the Bible tells us to be doing as Christ followers that we can't do. I mean, look at this list of things. How are you supposed to do these things without me knowing you and without you knowing me? Encourage one another and build one another up. Stir one another up to love and good works. All of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Make allowances for each other's faults. Live in harmony with each other. And most of all, love each other as if your life depends on it. I don't know how we can do these things unless we know each other. Now, you don't need to do this with everyone. This is not every person you meet, every Christian you meet, you need to have this kind of relationship with. But this is the relationship we've been called to as Christ followers. We've been called into this soul-to-soul intimacy. And God designed the family, the church family, to do just this. We get to know each other. And one of the things that keeps us from doing this is fear of exposure. But there's a fear that's even deeper than that. The other fear that causes insecurity is the fear of rejection. And honestly, this may be one of the greatest fears in human beings, is the fear of being rejected. We've all been rejected at some point. We all know how much it can hurt, so we fear it. And we close ourselves off and say, you know what, I'm never going to let anybody hurt me again. And up go the walls. Now maybe you've been hurt by rejection by somebody, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Maybe you felt rejection through a divorce or a parent who said, you know what, you're never going to amount to anything. You'll never be good enough. Or you felt the sting of rejection by a teacher or a coach in school. Maybe a family member has rejected you. Or maybe even you felt it by someone who claimed to be a Christ follower. If you would allow me to, I just would like to say to you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What you need to know is that God grieved at your rejection. God was sad when you got rejected. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. If anybody understands rejection, it's Jesus. He experienced rejection all over from the very people that he was there to bring closer to God until he finally experienced their ultimate rejection and they murdered him. But my encouragement to you is this. Please don't let that harden your heart. Please don't let that rejection take root in there. Don't let it build up and strengthen the walls and the protections that you put up. It really seems like the safe thing to do to just say, hey, I'm not going to get hurt anymore and then I'm going to put up these walls. But in reality, when you put those walls up, all you're doing is creating this self-imposed prison that you really don't want to be in. When you don't let anybody get close to you and you say, I'm not going to let anybody hurt me again, I believe you're making a terrible mistake because then you're not living anymore. You're just existing. And I believe that one of my jobs as your pastor is to help you 
and to encourage you and to say to you, take the risk. Have the courage to risk love again. Have courage to do it. Because if you'll do that, if you'll open up your life and you'll lower your barriers and you will let someone have the potential to hurt you, you will come alive again in ways that you've never experienced. I pray that you would just ask God for the courage to take that risk again, to be open and to be vulnerable. And for some reason, this seems to be a particularly strong struggle for guys. Guides, guys like to hold their cards close. We don't like to talk about our feelings and emotions. We don't let people know what we're really thinking or feeling. And I'll tell you, this Tuesday night group that Mark has been facilitating has really turned into a place where some guys have felt safe about sharing their struggles. And there's been growth as a result. We need to have spiritual partners in life, someone that you can level with, someone that you can encourage, someone that can encourage you, that you can grow with, that you can lean on for support, that you can share with. Somebody will have the courage and that you will have a relationship with that they can tell you what you're really like. When you ask, do I look fat in this? They'll say, yep. You know, a spiritual partner, someone who says, you know what? I I've seen this in you. And, and you can only do that with somebody that you have a relationship with. Please don't feel free to walk up to anybody in church and say, I really think you've got a problem with X, Y, Z. That's not for that. Those kind of things are said between people who know each other and love each other and have established a trust with each other. None of these things are about airing your stuff to everyone. But there is real power and ability to grow that happens just by sharing with somebody. All of us are only as sick as our secrets. And if you're living in fear, you're not really living. You want to open it up and you want to let it go. So now, if insecurity destroys relationships, well, then what builds them? And I think we're all ready for the answer to this one. It's love. Love overcomes insecurity, and it helps us to build and repair relationships. And, you know, I know that's a lofty ideal to just kind of throw out there. So let's just talk a minute about how we make that practical and get hold of it. We stand on this particular verse all the time. I quote this on the regular. 1 John 4, 18, love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it shows that his love has not been perfected in us yet. Now, the thing with that is, did you know that that's not only about God's love for us? I mean, yes, of course, it's totally about that, but it's not only about that. We're talking right now about rejection, specifically fear of rejection. Well, guess what? It's love that casts out that fear between us as well. Between us as well. What am I talking about? I know. Let me try to explain. When you love someone, who is the focus on? Is the focus on you or them? Well, them, of course. When you love someone, your focus is all on them. It's all about that person. Are they okay? Are they happy? Are they healthy? Is there something that I can do to make them happier? Your focus is all about them. And our verse says, love has no fear. Insecurity is the fear of what someone else is thinking about you. About you. The fear comes when the focus becomes on you. When it becomes all about you. Love is all about them. Fear comes in when I make it all about me. So when you take the focus off of you and you put it on the other person, that's when the fear goes away. I'll give you a real life example. Every now and then I get asked if I'm nervous when I'm speaking, when I'm preaching. And the answer to that is, yeah, of course I get nervous. I want to be sure that I don't say something done. I want to be sure that I don't inadvertently offend anyone. I also just want to do a good job. I don't want to be boring. I want to make sure the message makes sense and yields some sort of growth. And I'll tell you, that hasn't necessarily gotten better as we've been online. I think we have more people now watching throughout the week than we did at Sunday service. 
all of those insecurities are fears. It's basically fear that makes you nervous to speak in front of other people. But then now look at how love helps me overcome the fears that I have. When I take the focus on me and how I'm doing and what I'm going to do and put it on you guys, when I start thinking about the fact that I truly care for you, that what I'm speaking I'm doing because I truly love you guys and that I want us all to go from one level to another, that I, I want us all to grow and realize what God has for each one of us, that I want to see each one of us free from the lies that the enemy tells us, all of us. That I want us all to walk in victory. That I want to be on top of our circumstances, not under. Then my fears subside. Anytime you're in a position where you feel nervous and insecure, if you take the focus on what you're experiencing and put it on the fact that you love the other person, the fear just doesn't have any place then. It's got nowhere to sit. Okay, but how do I do that? How do I stop thinking about me and shift the focus on them? It's not like I can just turn off worrying about others just because you told me to. I get it. Well, 1 John 4.19 says we love each other because he loved us first. Your love for other people starts when you embrace God's love for you. God loves you. Now, you can choose to believe that or you can choose not to, but it doesn't change the fact that he does. God loves you more than you can ever imagine. And the moment you begin to realize how much God loves you, then you don't need to prove yourself anymore. I don't need to have to spend my life trying to impress people because I already know that God loves me. And that's liberating. That makes life a whole different experience. Because then my identity isn't assigned by what you think. My self-worth isn't based on your opinion or what you think of me on any given day. I mean, what am I supposed to do if you're having a bad day? It doesn't matter when I'm focused on my relationship to Christ. I'm not pressured by everyone else's expectations anymore. And that is how God's love now casts out the fear in us. Now, all of us want that. All of us want to live with that kind of confidence. Well, the Bible tells us where we get that. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, it says, All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect so we will not be afraid. Now the key word there is our love grows more perfect. This is a process. It's a process, and to be honest, it's a lifelong process. It's a journey, like I mentioned earlier. This is just taking a little bit every day. Because if I try to just have this confidence, I just snap my finger to say, yep, I'm confident now. You're just going to wind up faking it. And that's not going to do anything for you. It's something that grows over time. You just simply can't defeat insecurity overnight. It doesn't happen for any of us. But you can take the step right now in beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ or strengthening your relationship with Jesus Christ. When you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to a kind of love that can throw fear out the back door. It all begins with a relationship with him. Now, we've seen three things that destroy and break down relationships, and we've seen what the Bible says counteracts each of these three things. We saw that selfishness will break down a relationship, but selflessness will build or repair. We saw that pride breaks down relationships and that humility restores them. And then today we saw the effect of insecurity, but that love can overcome this insecurity. Those three things destroy relationships, and the Bible shows us the three things that restore that brokenness. But there's one more thing that will prevent you from working through any of them, and that's the last one I want to look at. It's resentment. Resentment. Resentment destroys relationships 
and it prevents you from working on any of those other things that we covered. And Job, it says this, it says, surely resentment destroys the fool. Listen, everybody blows it. We all make mistakes. We all fall short and we sin. I sin, you sin, the Pope sins, everybody sins. We're all sinners. And that means I'm not perfect. I just simply don't measure up to God's standard. I don't even measure up to my own standards. I mean, I disappoint myself a lot of times. And because we're all imperfect, we're going to hurt each other. And you're going to hurt people and other people are going to hurt you, whether that's intentional or unintentional. You've been hurt and you're going to be hurt again. It's just a simple reality of life. But what's more important than the hurt is what you do with that hurt. Are you going to allow it to make you bitter? Are you going to hold on to it? Are you going to keep focusing on it all the time? Because that's what builds resentment. And when you're resentful, you just don't think right. And you're not going to get to the place that you can tap into things like selflessness, humility, and love. Because you're too busy upset to do that. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 73. It says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, Bitterness is resentment. I was senseless and ignorant. Senseless and ignorant. You just don't think right. You don't see things. So what's the antidote to this? Well, the antidote to resentment is forgiveness. Forgiveness builds and restores relationships just like resentment tears it down. I mean, anybody knows that if you're going to have a nice long-term marriage that lasts your entire life, both people in that marriage are going to have to have massive doses of forgiveness doled out. Colossians 3 says this, says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. But I don't want to forgive people sometimes. Why should I forgive other people? Well, there's three reasons. First is that resentment just simply doesn't work. It only makes you miserable. And when you're holding on to a grudge, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. It doesn't help. So forgiveness is for your own benefit. Second thing, like this says, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. God tells us we need to forgive. And the third thing is that you're going to need more forgiveness in the future, so you better be offering it now to others. This is that whole concept of reaping what you sow. Most people think the concept of reaping what you sow is karma. Now, God laid that down way back with Noah. He said, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. The more forgiveness you put out there, the more forgiveness you're going to reap later on when you need it. I know for me, I'm going to need forgiveness later. So I want to make sure that I'm sowing those seeds of forgiveness now. This is just another way. This is just another one of those reasons that I'm a Christ follower is because I want to grow into a better person. I want to become more like Jesus because Jesus is the model of what I want to be. He's good. He loves. He has integrity. He's generous. He's caring. He's compassionate. And he's forgiving. Now, if you're at a point where you're saying, you know what, I just can't do it. I just cannot forgive that other person. That's when you need to reach out for Jesus. That's when you need him. Because quite honestly, some hurts just are too hard to forgive on your own. Because you can only muster up so much human love. Sometimes we need God's supernatural love to fill us. In Titus 3, it says, Once our lives were full of resentment and envy. We hated others and they hated us. But then, he, Christ, saved us. Not because we were good enough, but because of his kindness. That's the grace bath. By washing away our sins, everything's forgiven, wiped out. And giving us the new joy of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
all because of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, did so that he could declare us good in God's eyes. Sometimes the only way to get past resentment is to experience God in your life. Sometimes you're never going to be able to let it go until you get God's love in you each and every day and each and every moment. Now, I want to be clear because I need to explain and make sure you understand what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not making excuses for that person that hurt you. They hurt you and it was real. Forgiveness is not minimizing the hurt because it hurt. Forgiveness is not justifying it. It's not saying it's no big deal because it was a big deal. Forgiveness isn't saying it wasn't wrong because it was wrong. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is really easy. It's really simple. Forgiveness is as simple as this. It's letting go of the pain and letting go of my right to get even. You're right to get even. Now, why would anybody do that? I do it for my own sake because you are living in misery the longer you hold on to these things. Some of you are still allowing people from your past to hurt you in the presence and that's just in the present and that's just foolish the past is in the past every time you hold on to that grudge you're perpetuating your own pain and that's just silly the only hurt is there is when you refuse to let it go if you hold on to it as a grudge and resentment you're hurting yourself god says let it go and forgiveness is the only way to get on with your life do they deserve it probably not no in fact definitely not did you deserve to be forgiven? I didn't. But God did it anyway, out of his grace and kindness. You may have had some relational disasters in your life. If you have, then welcome to the human race, because everybody has relational disasters. Everybody. But what are you going to do with them? God wants to restore and build and grow relationships in your life. And he gives us the tools to do it. And he says that he'll help us. All you need to do is ask for his help and do what he says. The more you can walk in selflessness, in humility, in love, and in forgiveness, the greater your relationships are going to be here and now. And the more peace and joy you're going to have in your life. This is why I'm in this walk. It's for the here and now. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everything you teach us in the word, for every promise in your word, Lord God. I thank you so much for the truths that are in there. I thank you that you stand there with your hand outstretched, wanting to help us through these things that we make in our lives, Lord. So, Father, I pray that as we press into these things, that you would reveal yourself, that we would see your hand working, Lord God, that we would see your hand when we need to grasp onto it. I pray for each person here that they would also see your hand, Lord. And that, Lord, that you would bring relationships into our lives that are full of peace and full of joy, Lord God. That we would have the relationships that you intended for us to have within our church and within our families and our homes, Lord. So, Father, I thank you for your promises, Lord God. I pray that you just bless us now as we press into this now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So again, I hope you're with someone as you're watching this. And today, you know, if you feel comfortable, I want to invite you to talk about which of these relationship blockers is the struggle for you. To just kind of get honest with the person that you're with. And that's up to you if you want to do that or not. Please make sure that anybody is comfortable having a pass. We don't want to pressure this, but we do want to invite it. We do want to invite you to have an opportunity to grow with each other. So if you feel comfortable doing that, I would just ask you to do that. And if not, that's fine. That's fine. This is just an invitation to share what's going on inside of you. So I invite you to do that. I invite you to just kind of cover those things. And then I invite you to pray and to minister to each other as we do every week. And, you know, I love what's going on with this. I say hello to that new smash group meeting in North Brantford and, uh, I love you guys so very, very much. I pray that you've been blessed by this. I pray that you are going to be able to enjoy this Advent season, this holiday season, this Christmas season, and uh, that you would all experience the peace 
that Advent has for us in this second week. So God bless each of you. Heavenly Father, I just pray you bless your people now. Bless our discussions, Lord God. May you grow us through these relationships now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. God bless you. I hope you have a great talk, and I'll see you soon. To see things like you do God, I look to you You're where my help comes from Give me wisdom You know just what to do Oh yeah I trust you See things like